Okay, we can we can go ahead and start now. Okay, yeah, there's, there's six people and the other new people aren't coming in here, so. Yeah. Okay, let me get, start out. Um, I mean, th there are various origins, like when Dan and I met in 97, decided one day we're going to do a business. But my particular sort of path to be able to program, as Dan said, the Apple II, uh, there was a company called ECD, which made capacitors for me to decide they were going to make a PC, which is a whole story in itself. I mean, it's, it's a 16 megabyte multiprocessor, everything PC, with one mistake, design error. They, they didn't realize you have to make it for less than you sell it for. Right. How much did they sell it for? <laughs> a few thousand. No, no, it was no. a great was it like nine eight seven six? Five? Oh yeah, yes, yeah, some uh, yes. You're right, an arbitrary number. It was a very sophisticated machine, over designed by an order of magnitude, but it gave me a lot of practice for writing um, sixty five or two code, which was just, you know, again fortunate. And you should look at the whole sixty five or two history. Um, but one of the things there. Uh, again, this is going to be out of order, but I'm going to try to keep it sort of chronological. Was a macro package, uh, so that which I then refined uh, in order to write. This is, code. this is the this is the assembler, the that ran, ran on. Well, first it ran on mult. There's one that ran on multics. Okay, and That's what you originally wrote it on was on multics. Mm -hmm. which is the MIT time-sharing system that we both worked for. Yes. We, at midnight, basically, third shift time was cheap. Only cost and, a dollar an hour. And ECD had a... Um, well, ECD, uh, yeah. ECD had tools on Multics, which was convenient. Uh, and we were competing with the Ada development team, which was dialed in from uh, France in the middle of the night. In the middle of our night. It was their day. Um, so, but the, the main point is... The Apple II, we need to program an assembler in order to fit. And even though I didn't like the idea of assembler, it was the appropriate thing to do. With the macro package, it was actually quite doable. Uh, so because I, I mean, you know, first saw the Apple II was a toy computer, but by not, by 78, uh, and we can go into why I chose the Apple II. I, don't, I first did a project with personal software for practice, just for the heck of it porting a bridge from the TRS-80 to the Apple II. So I was, you know, was using the Apple II. Um, again, each of these is stories own right, but when Dan had the idea, was busy, I, you know, I had these skills, we figured it had to be an assembler because there was no rumor. I mean, remember, we we're going for 16K. Now, most of the call can conceptualize that. So I'm, I'm curious, if Ben looks like, did you ever use a 16K machine? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> okay. You know, that's only one uh, millionth what we have now. My, my desktop is four million times that. Uh, but back, in my freshman year in college, back in my freshman year in college, uh, we, uh, we had a 16K PDP 1134A. Yeah. Actually, two of them. One was timeshare and one run in single user mode for the graduate level classes. Uh, timeshare, 16K, that might have been a little low for timesharing, but uh, right. but there was a Unix that uh, a pro, that was stripped out for even a smaller machine on the 1105. But, the, the, you know. Which I had programmed for before. Uh, yeah. 1105. Not 1105, yeah. And it was, I mean, we, we knew how to make things small in those days. PDK 8. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, I programmed for a. 512 byte um, machine. Oh, yeah. No, we could, yes. Less, in any case, uh, so the key, key thing was all these techniques I used to save memory. For example, loops would go down rather than up because we could save one byte for the testing for the end case. Now, the way to go to this programming, because you mentioned the disassemblies, it wouldn't be obvious. Uh, there was no that was, hot, that was hot in those days. Go to list programming was a hot topic. It was a hot topic. But the reason I did it, a little aside is I disagreed with Dijkstra on why. Was Dijkstra came at it from math, and I realized he missed the point. The point about go to list programming was that the static state and the dynamic state were in alignment, so you could figure out what was happening. The problem is, Verth got it wrong. 
and he glommed onto the single exit thing in Pascal, which meant mm. you had all these complex switches. Um, but in any case, getting on. So mm. w the tools allowed me to do maintainable code. But uh, the ma main thing mm. was I figured we should start with the prototype. So I'd be, I remember, and I was still at Interactive Data, sitting back in a class that were giving us on something, designing the data structures. Uh, and I basically started prototyping it. I called the module SS and it for spreadsheet and it. Little did I know that's what would ship. So people wonder, did we know the word spreadsheet? Well, the name of the, the code was SS and it. <laughs> Yes. But the thing is, we saw spreadsheets. Oh, it's on. What? Did something just say something? Let me put up the chat so I can see if people are making side remarks. Oh, there's side remarks. Okay. Um, it, it, so we, this is before I came up with the name VisiCalc. We'll get to that story and, and you know the arguments over that. Um, so Dan first did a prototype in... Um, mm -hmm. Basic. Now, Dan, do you have the URL for your talk on this? That part, there are a lot somewhere. I don't know where. I, I mean, can find the TEDx talk. There's, with a, TEDx. there's a TEDx talk. It's on TED.com. If you search Dan Bricklin TED.com, you'll find it. But it doesn't get into, uh, it gets into some, but not all the story well, the key, of, but of the, the key first point. prototype. Yeah. The key point is that we had to, I had to junk a lot of our program experience. Uh, to first name variables that was obvious you need to point rather than name things. Uh, and in fact, you notice that this, a lot of work went in deciding this and implementing, calling it A1 and with the uh, letters going across, numbers down because it had to do 52 weeks plus a spreadsheet, as Dan would point out, for production planning, not just for finance. And then so you can have, you know, the numbers would go down, but you got more rows. Oh, so they could be narrower if I did if we did the letters at the top, then when you hit a hundred, it was you still were at only two two characters wide. Yes, but and you, it, 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 the main thing no, was to get the two across. across. Yes, uh, but um, one as an aside, in the first prototype, I gave you the ability to relabel things, so you didn't have to use the letters. Uh, and then we decided that there were too many issue problems in terms of the user experience by giving that much freedom. Mm -hmm. So, but I did remove the code. All I did was prevent you from going into those columns. Because again, you know, it, it was, the goal was, my design approach is to do scaffolding. You all, you try to have working code all the time because for two reasons. Number one, it's no fun if it doesn't work, to be honest. But it also keeps it keeps you honest and may, you know, making it work. And because of that, Dan was able to play with it and work on the user experience uh, while I was doing the coding. And that worked well because he was busy, again, busy in school, couldn't do the coding. But because he understood the code and I understood the business goals, we were able to negotiate. So we'd want a feature and then we can work out the budget. Is this worth putting in? Is there a way to do it? Um, and we continue, for example, one of the features we left out was the help system. Yep. Was 2K. Ended up with the most minimal help system, which which you ended up double using for something else. Well, we didn't really put the help, what we did instead of the help system. We, so, we, it was we, supposed to have help. I mean, yeah. if I look at my original, you know, right up of the spec of stuff on it, it says here, you know, in here was uh, there was a help. Yeah. Well, so H H was supposed to get you help. And you know? I was, again, we compromised. So there are two things we did. Number one, the rule was if you couldn't explain it on the reference card, change the program. Now it turns out RoboCade was still more expensive, complicated than it should have been, uh, because I think uh, what we didn't do was the idea that went into Excel was the dollar sign or the oh, Mitch, it? Mitch came up with that. Mitch came up with that. Well, I don't and know I, if it's Mitch or it's John. Yeah, know, but Mitch came but, up with it. So, but for the most part, it, it, we want it to be, I won't get totally intuitive, but it should be possible to figure it all out. Oh, sorry, not um, Mitch. Mitch Kapoor. 
or Rich Mitch Kapoor, Kapoor. Yes. just so you should know for those that don't, the guy who did one, two, three. Yeah, who happened to be uh, come to us after we showed it to me, when it was looking for a job. So we recommended to be product manager at Personal Software, and later it became Visicorp. So, you know, he was very familiar with, you know, the spreadsheet, and he had his own products, uh, which we meshed with. We can get to that. I have one up there. So, um, so Dan had the prototype, and I started working from that, not implementing, you know, implementing the spirit of it. Um, and, and like, we move where the entry areas and things like that. We all, we, I mean, there are a lot of features we left out. For example, we thought about putting moving graphics at the bottom because the Apple had a feature where you can mix a text screen and a graphic screen. Do you remember that? Not at the same time, you can only go oh, yeah. back. No, there was a split screen mode. No, oh, yeah, no. Yeah. We can put big yeah. map at the bottom. Nobody, I think, used it for the obvious reason. But the, thing, but the thing you did put in is you put in multiple, you could have two windows split horizontally or vertical. And both of those windows had what you might call locked panes. They call them now. Mm -hmm. And they could do synchronized scrolling that when you scrolled one window, the other window in the same direction would scroll, but the locked panes would fit. So you basically could have two portals with the titles staying correctly in your 32K ver version of the... And you can also do primitive graphing okay. using asterisk by putting an asterisk mode in. No, you, you so there, were, you know, again, all these things. Remember, in the day, even access graph was a major improvement. But yeah. I'm getting a little ahead of myself because you want the, the guts of the implementation. So, you know, one of the early decide was the layout. So, we, you know, we worked on, you know, came up with the cellular structure, uh, which meant, you know, the representation. You have to look at the bytes. Where's the end of the byte? How does it continue to the next cell? But to answer the question is. We, we we needed vectors for the spreadsheet itself because you couldn't you didn't want to have the memory laid all out. So we, one, we didn't know if it would be hard if you'd be a mainly horizontal spreadsheet or mainly vertical or, spreadsheet. or a mixture or a mixture. So that's where we need to do dynamic and allocation and comp compaction. And part of the goal was to make sure that it was deterministic. It wouldn't sometimes run out of memory sometimes. In other words, if you reloaded something that used up oh, exactly let me, uh, every yeah. single byte, if you were right to the edge of every single byte, if you wrote that out and then read it back in, it would still fit. But not only that, it uh, run out yeah, we're, out. we're getting ahead because of the allocation. If we wrote it out A1 uh, going down, it would have taken forever, which would be continually reallocating. So the save format went from the lower right first. And the save format was the same keystrokes you would type in. So that, that and by the way, a lot of this still works in Excel to this day. I, I suspect you can load a VisiCon spreadsheet into Excel and it still work. More or less. So, so, Bob, if I remember right, the, the layout was that there was... Um, uh, an array of of rows. Yes, and, I think uh, it was row first to count. Yeah. Okay, and then each of those could go out any number. Yes, and but, that was an array sideways. Yes, but those are contiguous, which is why we need the memory right. allocation. So you could actually put something in the bottom rightmost corner as long as you didn't fill in a lot of other. Yes, I, 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 I'm not sure they had partial arrays, but yes, you, you, you could overflow it by, you know, doing a lot of empty rows, but few people did that. The other thing, and I was saying, got rid of a lot of experience. We knew about Maxima and what people are so proud of. They've had a natural order of recount. Well, the original one, the goal was to calculate the dependent, to have a dependency graph so that whenever it didn't matter which order you did it in. And one thing I realized is, you know, we don't need to do that. Most spreadsheets go, you know, basically people put it in order. And we did give you the ability to row first or column first. And if you did have a circular dependency, you just recalculate twice. Right. So in other words, you could recalculate, um, you know, this one, this one, you know, across and then across and then across and across or down, 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 down. You got to decide that um, in terms of the order of recalc. Um, and it's saved, but the thing is that if we had natural order, 
the feeling was it would have taken up a little bit of space to keep to count to keep track of that. Let's say you use the linked list. It would have been a lot, a lot of rid of, that would have gotten rid of maybe one one third of your memory or more would go away. And people wanted every byte to be able to do very large spreadsheets. <laughs> what was amazing is how little pushback we got on that. Yes. Where we did where one of the mistakes I made was though we could have done variable column widths, but that would have required an indirect table. I mean, one of the things I learned about programming is once you realize something, it becomes obvious. But going in, remember, we, performance was a real consideration. And we come from the good old days when, you know, uh, uh, one million instructions per second was a fast machine. And these are byte instructions. So, so one of the things you were doing is you wanted to, we, we wanted to go as fast as the repeat key that it could display the screen. It was redisplaying the screen as fast as the repeat key. It actually didn't. What? But well, well, we didn't under we didn't realize that each Apple II was a little different. It was an RC circuit. It wasn't a timer. Yeah, but that's uh, not the way I implemented it. No, the way I implemented it was that's a good. But you bring up a good point. There was no clock. I couldn't get interrupts from the keyboard, so, and they could be coming in in the stream. So there, was, so I didn't want to lose keystrokes because if the program was calculating, you'd lose keystrokes. Right, and Electro Pencil was losing keystroke. The word processor was losing keystrokes, and that's no good. Yeah, so carriage returning out of weight. So throughout the program, it would pull the keyboard and queue up the keystrokes, but for repeated keys, it would throw away keys past what you were doing. So no matter how much you held the keyboard down, it would not scoot over. You lift the keys, it stopped. It didn't. It didn't buffer those up if it's the same key over and over yeah. again. So, or, or uh, I, I forget the details, but basically, yeah, there might have been, I'm not sure the rule repeated key, because we had to, if you type AAA, it's had it to work. So I think it might have been just for the scrolling. But, yeah. you know, it, it, it would be interesting to look at the code and try to remember. So if I recall, remember right, so memory was <clears throat> broken up into chunks that were all the same size. which for was the, also, not, yeah. not for the spreadsheet index table, but for the data, yes. For the data. And um, so therefore, and um, I was concerned about speed of uh, display and I wanted the, the numbers to work the same way as your calculator. So therefore, uh, not, instead of using binary arithmetic to use um, decimal arithmetic. Um, so uh, I remember right, you, you found decimal arithmetic code in Dr. Dobbs or something. No, what happened, the decimal arithmetic I figured out myself. What we did, I don't think it went to Dr. Dobbs for no, that. Not there, no, it's the display, sorry. The converting, de the thing about decimal, with decimal numbers is, first of all, decimal numbers, because I wanted it to be the same as your calculator. This is my calculator. And the other was that conversion from internal to display could be really fast. It, it, it's theory. It turns out I screwed that up, but we'll get to that later. Uh, but the decimal thing had 12 digits, which turns out to be very useful because somebody at Livermore had his Apple III requisition to send to Washington because they had to calculate this budget. Well, we, we actually decided that. Yes. We decided how many digits. We basically said, um, what's the largest thing we would want people to be able to calculate? And it was the budget of the U.S. in dollars. So that's why it was 12. So that's how we figured out how many significant yeah. figures to have. Now, getting ahead of our story, uh, one problem we ran into was Carl Helmers, who some of you might remember, wrote an article praising Visicalc. He, and the, he was the editor of Byte magazine. Yeah, the transcendental functions. Which we the problem was we decided transcendental functions were too much of a pain and we were going to defer them. After he extolled them, we had to sit down, and I think Dan did a lot of work, figure out how do you compute, you know, transcendental functions at, with 12-digit um, accuracy numbers in decimal, because all this stuff was mostly binary. So we had to figure that out. It turns out well, they're very slow. But they you know worked. how we did it? You know how we figured it out? Well, you had a book you found. Because I wrote it. It was a yes. book. And who told me about the book? Who? Carl? Monty Davidoff. Oh, Monty Davidoff. Oh, what did he write as a summer student? Which oh, the which transcendentals was... for for Microsoft Basic. Yes, and he uh, he had done that before, I think. 
he told me about the book. I don't know if I still have it up there somewhere. Um, and the book basically told you how to do, you know, the algorithms for doing transcendentals. So and we did it. It was a pain, but we did it. Yeah. The yeah, trick yeah. was to do it in a small space. My only code that I got in the in the product was yes. That. But we had to make it fit, again fit in the small One space. Yes. Wasted a whole K. Yeah. Uh, but getting back to the main implementation, uh, so something as I said, fixed column with stuff was simple because we wrote directly to the screen. Now, looking back, one of the reasons it didn't move variable column and stuff, we another level of indirection. Turns out that maybe for me, we realized we were actually far beyond the performance goal if, in some areas. Other areas are slow because we're doing the slow arithmetic. It, like if you use transcendental functions, you'd notice the speed. But for the most part, you know, it was basically an 8-bit, 1-megabit machine that was highly interactive, and that was the, the key. Right. Now, you could turn off recalculation if it was too slow. Mm -hmm. When I did my um, uh, my prototype, I made it make it a sound every time it recalculated a cell. See here, tick, 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 tick. It turned out making the sound on the Apple II, which is done by timing loops, uh, took up almost all the time. So I got rid of it, and then it went much faster. Yes. But, um, so we didn't do that. Um, in fact, yeah, uh, if you the original software that we had, if you um, did certain things, it would make a beep, or if you hit the edge, you try to move the the cursor, yeah. you know, past the edge, it would go big, 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 tick, tick, tick. Um, if you run the simulators in JavaScript that we have today yep. that run the IBM version of it, you'll hear tick, tick. you hear the stuff that's too fast frequency because it's so much faster than the old one was, than the original was. We attuned it to the speed of the uh, the CPU. So one of the other things we did, you know, we did have a help system. Uh, uh, actually, look, uh, even before that, the goal was to make it very interactive. And one of the things you learn about the user interface is people think uh, they have infinite freedom when they have very few choices, but the choices are obvious. So uh, one of the things, when you hit an arrow key, people didn't realize sometimes it would move it across the expression, sometimes it would move it to another cell. So the algorithm was figuring out, okay, you're... you're you know, in a certain part of the equation, it obviously want to move it in there. You another thing, it obviously yeah. wanted to move it to another cell. John Reese came up with that idea. That was John Reese. That was John Reese who came up with the idea because originally I had said that if you were going to say one plus and then you wanted to point something, you'd push the U button, mean that I want to use that value and then point to it. And then John said, "Look, if you have a calculation, if you have an expression that ends with." Um, a binary operator, yeah. then then pointing to something is uh, uh, is clearly going. The only legal thing to do would be to to be adding a um, a cell reference to the equation. But if you put in two plus two and then pushed an arrow key, clearly you want to go to the next cell. You want to save it and go to the next cell. So you don't have to hit. You don't have to hit um, yeah. carriage return. My background was from computerized typesetting and word processing where people were paid by the keystroke. And I was trying to minimize, I, this had to be really fast. So I want to minimize the number of keystrokes for everything that you're doing. Um, and that minimized keystrokes, you could say 25, uh, you know, arrow, 33 down arrow, something, and just put numbers in the same way you would on a, um, uh, on a calculator where you do, you know, one of the interesting things is uh, Dan found the paddles were too bad to use for inferring, but it, that was actually fortunate because with the spreadsheet, if you have to go to the mouse, you lose. It's much faster if you can keep your fingers on the home keys. Now, one of the things by product not having a help system uh, was that we um, had to basically couldn't get, we all oh the other thing we didn't want were error messages error messages take a lot of space so rather than giving you error messages we would just show you what we thought you wanted and you can so if you typed add s it would complete with sign and if you typed add s i 
we still completed the sign. We just ignored the extra characters that match our expectations. And if you didn't want sign, well, nothing happened because you didn't have any other option. So we didn't need a health system. In other words, you could not enter anything illegal. And right. And if you hit, if you can see, and no, it's not on the thing behind you. If you hit the slash key, we have slashes because I didn't like using control because it was harder for me to do that because I was born with two bent little fingers and it made it harder to push down and stuff like that. So I went with slash just like in the old IBM systems where slash was the beginning of a command on the the um, uh, the card system. Slash, so, slash, okay. DD star, stuff like that. Yeah. By the um, way, but but like if, if you press slash, it would show you the letters that were acceptable. It said, so you would type slash and it would show you the link. And what did you do? And where, what was that, Bob? What was that list of letters? You I remember right. you told me it was the lookup table itself that you oh. used to look up. Oh, yeah. No, everything was self right But yeah, because you did it monitor. Save, to save bytes, the, the prompt was actually used as the lookup table. Yes. There was a lot of fully, but the key, by the way, slash still works in Excel and with the physical commands. Um, slash is, is treated the same as the alt key in Excel. No, actually, no. It brings up physical commands, no. not Excel commands. No, no, no. Thought it brings up. No, it, it it's the same. You can. So, like, if you type slash IR, it'll insert it a row. Uh, uh, okay, I, I might have been wrong. Slash, you try it. You slash, and suddenly it's the same as if you push. Yeah, good. Thanks for, for you. Know, go check on Excel. I checked this sometime I, in the last couple months. Uh, so, if I type slash F. Uh, you're right. It, it doesn't do formatting. What, what does slash do? Uh, a slash does. It acts like alt exactly. It's right. not just like alt. It First turns slash. out. So I was able to cheat and say that if you do slash ir, it inserts a row, mm -hmm. and that's the same keystrokes that worked on Visicalc, but a whole lot of other ones don't work. Yeah. So uh, you're right. <laughs> but it can. But, but I think they, some they, of the keystrokes are the same. I do. They think they I, they can read Visicalc, save Visicalc spreadsheets. Uh, they could read one, two, three spreadsheets, which could read VisiCalc spreadsheets. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I doubt whether many people use that feature. By the way, the other implementation... Oh, a lot of people used it back then. Oh, yeah. And you that was it? in the, the lawsuit that uh, that that um, uh, Mike, that uh, Lotus went against others. They said, well, you know, uh, we're uh, the way that Excel does things by reading our files directly, that's the way you should do it. So, okay. But one reason, a strong reason we had to re reload from the bottom right is for cassette support. The problem with <laughs> cassettes is they ran at a constant speed. You can't so stop. we had to process it fast enough to read the sheet off a cassette. And we shipped with cassette support. We just didn't tell anybody. <laughs> so this thing that you're saying that what basically the keystrokes that... Um, that basically we put in the thing that greater than was the same as moving to a place. So if we had greater than a one colon, which was the same as a carriage return, treated as a carriage return, you could, and then you could put in what would be there. Basically the, 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 what you could type was the same as what was saved. It was, what was saved is exactly the keystrokes. They were necessary for that. Uh, yeah, no, really that, easy for other right. programs. Wait, so other programs could write those files, and there are companies that formed some of which are still around, I believe, that wrote that format so that people could read data into VisiCalc. I think uh, Outlook Soft. Um, is Outlook? No, what's it called? Um, not Outlook. Um, what's the the company? It's down in. Um, uh, down in uh, uh, Nor uh, Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, they, um, there are all sorts of, that's what they started with. Mm -hmm. And so companies actually had add-ins for VisiCalc programs that would it's write not, Even though it was not supposed to work, they reverse solved it. There are all sorts of hacks, like Sideways, Paul Funk's company, to print yeah. long spreadsheets by printing them sideways. But back to the Apple II programming, you, you remind me another thing we did on the Apple II, yeah, which was, was automatically detect what kind of cards you had in. So if you want, if you basically accessed a serial port, or what, what we, we figured out was a printer, we would print. Um, 
and other and we'd see you know, and we'd have to figure out do you have a disk drive? None of this was standard. We'd basically figured out signature bytes by looking looking at each card and saying, okay, how do we figure out which card you've got in there? And remember, again, we had no clock, so we had to figure out how to do all of this, you know, dynamically. Uh, the disk stuff, we didn't want to sign Apple's um, agreement, which it said they can basically revoke it at 30 days' notice. So I had to reverse engineer. You to put the to put the DOS on our disks or anything like that. Yes. Right. Well, we yes, yeah, so we didn't need DOS. We basically I reverse engineered Wozniak's disk format, and it was clever. I mean, Woz had some nice clever code there. Um, and as a matter of fact, the first file system we shipped because I had a bug in the file system it would overwrite the bitmap. And for the people who were careful and made two copies, it overwrote both copies. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was the this was the thing we did with copy protection. Oh, well, there's another. Yeah, that yeah. Was, well, no, this, this was, was an initial copy. thing. There was thing that, yeah, figuring that people would copy the disk. What what we did is we would you would you would write onto the disk because Apple II's had uh, a you know a, a write protect switch, and the disks we would ship with would have. The right protect tab there, right? So that if you wrote on yourself, not a problem. Turned out Apple didn't QA those very well. Yes, and there were a lot of disks that uh, disk drives that the right protect switch didn't work. And what luck? One of the cus testers we had here was such a person, and that's how we found out about it. Yes. Unfortunately, one of the other people was Steve Jobs. <laughs> But I should distinguish between yeah. things. The overriding was one bug, but we also, I read the file system managed bitmap to show you what sectors are allocated. So th that one I overwrote, but I forgot to put the, I forgot to put the bitmap of the bitmap table into the, into itself. <laughs> so that was a bug. By the way, they shipped with 13 sector disks. Then they came out with 16 sector disks. So I wrote the program. So when you boot, it would figure out which you had and automatically adapt to it, which very few programmers did in those days. So, Bob, what that reminds us is that here you ran in, in 32K bytes. Yes. Okay. Now, that included uh, the the operating system. All of your, they, that all was mostly wrong, but there was a little. The operating system that you wrote, the, the disk the disk stuff that you oh, wrote. Include all the disk stuff. The oper yeah, we had to write our own operating system. Yeah, you wrote your own operating system. So included the operating system, had to fit in the 32K. The your All the of the code was code, right? fit there. And your, um, your um, uh, what's it called? All your data had to fit there. And the screen buffer all had to fit in the same 32K. It was tight. So a 16K machine is really like a 10K machine. So the job that you had to make this all work with multiple scrolling windows that would split with synchronized scrolling and calculation and transcend up, that was no mean feat. You know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, people talk about writing small Windows programs and things. And, you know, our definition of small <laughs> has changed over the years. VisiCalc is smaller than the GIF to be able to show a screenshot Yes, of it running. More fave icon, yes. Um, but, again, uh, let's see. Any, you know, there are all sorts of uh, different directions I can take this. And I'm also interested in if there are any questions while we're doing this. Um, the original code itself, we, unfortunately, we lo the original listings of the code itself are on a tape somewhere deep in the bowels of IBM because Lotus lawyers wanted to keep it around. It, it, we Basically, we were stupid in that. Again, these are hindsight things. We should have made a copy of the tape. Right. It wouldn't have been that hard, but we just didn't think of it. You know, and that well, it was not cheap in those days to do such things. And, yeah, but uh, it would have been, again, you look back, right. you should have done it, but, you know. Who who thinks of those things? Yeah, uh, but it, but then, you know, so we had the tools on Multics, but as soon as we got our own computer, the Prime, we need to port the tools. So I will have to write our own tools. So one of the tools I did was an assembler, which had all these macros, a little better than one on Multics. I also we need an editor, 
And I was playing with writing a QED like editor. Q so for those who don't know, QED is the ancestor of ED on, on Linux. And the reason I can use ED, if you press colon, the commands, I or actually I don't even call it ED, but for them you do, I, I learned back in 1966 still work. But by the time that time, I wanted an Emacs. So I turned the, the QED code within PL1 into an Emacs code. Eventually. Initially, I wrote the first editor for you. A simple, yeah. I wrote a simple editor, and I wrote a bookkeeping system that we used to keep bookkeeping for our company at the beginning. And you wrote the, what, assembler linker. Yeah, well, the, the, well and, yeah, it's right, it, whatever it did to put, yeah, the stuff to get it downloaded to paper tape so I can put it on the Apple II. Paper tape? No, no. No, we, we skipped the paper tape. It went directly. No, it was, uh, you did it through uh, the, the serial, serial, file. Yeah. serial port. Serial port. And later we went directly with the serial port. But it was always a pain, you know, it, 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 we had to do this. We, know, didn't have a we didn't have a simulator. Well, later, by the way, we got we got in-circuit emulators and things. And the interesting thing there was, I remember we'd, I was debugging a strange bug. Couldn't figure out what was happening until I noticed the bit in the Apple II the bike changed spontaneously. We had bad memory. Hmm. The advantage of being stuck in emulator. But there were, you know, working through the night, there were sometimes you had these edge bugs, which took forever to find. That was a that was a hardware device that could you could yeah. plug plugged into over the chip or into the instead of the chip or something. Yeah, replace the CPU when you could emulate it. But that was later when we were rich, sort of, and could afford, could afford such things. They were they were thousand bucks or Right. But initially, you know, it's programming in the attic in the middle of the night till we had, we started demoing it, then it would show it to people in January, well, for the Pepsi case. Uh, I don't know, it was in January. January of 79. Was it January? You, you didn't demo it. January said, no, you use it to do your homework. Yeah, I use it to do my homework. I mean, I talk about that in, in the TED Talk. Great while you do this. The TED Talk, um, which is... An interesting thing that uh, so the first the the first use uh, for a bit real business case was was on a case for Harvard Business School. The case was about the Pepsi challenge and the person in it disguised was actually John Scully. So it was John John Scully who later on ran Apple for a while. And uh, that was the first first time. And I talk about that. If you go to Ted.com and look at look at my video I'll talk about. It. I don't have to say it here, give that long story. But um, we kept testing it, kept bringing people in. I brought in various professors and all who took a look at it and uh, and tried it uh, and gave us feedback. Um, Michael Porter gave us advice on how to sell it and stuff like that, famous professor now. Um, but um, we got good advice. It was helpful to be at Harvard Business School because you get free consulting from these professors who would charge a fortune otherwise. One of the people who uh, advised us was Jim Cash. Professor Cash is now retired. There's a building named after him called the Cash House at Harvard Business School. He was on the ended up on the board of Microsoft and on the board of Walmart uh, and uh, among other places. Uh, he's um, a very important professor at Harvard Business School, and he was my professor when I, uh, when I was there. Um, <clears throat> but um, are there questions? Do people have questions? There are enough people. They're fine. I mean, there, it looks like there, there are at least 20 of you watching. So somebody must have a question. Well, the count right now is 16 people uh, who are joined here. I'm not sure how many are on YouTube at the moment. They're on the YouTube. There's seven, and when there are two of us, and two of them are us, so that's five more. Okay. So, so how? What other? What? What were you expecting to hear that you haven't heard yet? I can't really think of anything. So I guess I'm I'm curious. Um, so before. Uh, um, VisiCalc came out. What you hear is like, or at least my like, what I've heard about VisiCalc is like it's the killer app for the Apple II. So, like, before and after VisiCalc came out, like I'm sure like 
once that once the release happens, like your relationship with Apple really changes, <laughs> and like you now become like a core, like kind of well, they they made a competing product eventually with Apple. But sure. Whatever, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is like, what was the sort of like the the rise from being like two people working on a project oh. to like a, now it's a giant thing and you're like the driving right. force behind a giant computer company? Well, they weren't giant at the time. They were tiny. Uh, and as Steve Jobs is recorded, I can play you the recording of him saying, if it weren't for VisiCalc, you'd be interviewing somebody else right now. Okay. So they knew how important it was and they wouldn't ship the, it seemed like they didn't ship the Apple three until we got, we okayed the release of the Apple three version of VisiCalc. Um, but um, there were no, there wasn't something that you could type in and move over and put in uh, equations, the wet interactive scroll around and all that. There weren't any, you could buy anywhere else. This is new. You know, my original design was using a mouse and not columns and rows, as I say in the TED Talk. The columns and rows came in later. The whole idea is that you can put things anywhere you want. There aren't specific columns and rows. Um, and um, in terms of, um, you know, so that was, you know, we had this idea for this uh, interactive word processing with numbers. And I wrote one of the first interactive word processors, uh, uh, an early one, not the first, but before Wang had their word processor, I had worked on a word processor at Digital Equipment Corporation that we sold lots of copies of for many years. Um, but um, so electronic spreadsheet, VisiCalc was the first of what we now call electronic spreadsheet. You know, uh, there are some people say, oh, we had the first, you know, because we had the thing that had natural order recalc, which is baloney because it wasn't interactive on a computer screen. Natural order recap was not an important thing because people bought, you know, a hundred thousand copies of hundreds of thousands of copies of VisiCalc, not worrying about that, and used it to great benefit. The important thing is that you could do what if, you could interactively do it on a computer that you could buy and put right in front of you, and stuff like that. Uh, and then you could get much better output when one two three came out, um, and stuff, you know, that sort. So there was nothing now. now we expected to put it on all sorts of different computers real quick. It's on the Apple II first because Bob knew how to do it. Was an Apple II was available. Well, well, it, it, the, right. the Apple II decision was driven by the fact they cornered the market on disk drives. Oh yes, right. That they apparently they had made some deal to get all of the disk drives that Sugar Associates made, all the five and a quarter inch disk drives, over the ones they had already committed to for a certain number of months or whatever. So, so that you couldn't get an Apple, you couldn't get many disk drives for the other personal computers. So personal software, our publisher said, do the Apple II first. So it, it, it's the interesting and thing. We were expected to put it on all these other machines. You know, we were expected to have it on the Commodore, the Commodore PET, which we did, or uh, the Atari 800, um, and then eventually the TRS-80, which required a recode. Well, uh, a, a, a bit about that. Uh, so any, anybody know who Brad Templeton is? He was like one of the EFF people. He's very active in the industry now. He's doing a lot of stuff for Robocars. He can have an EFF at one point. Yeah, he, he was the kid who came out to help us figure out the pet. Uh, and that's a whole story. For, I mean, each computer of those computers had a story. and We learned a lot about it. Uh, and the Commodore is a whole interesting story in, in its own right with somebody in charge of this ROM, somebody in charge of this ROM, and the peripheral buses and stuff. Thing. Uh, then, and we did the Atari, which is also a much more sophisticated machine, but the disk drive was smaller. And then uh, we hired... But, now, the thing is, with Apple first, if I remember right, our publisher, who helped to make the decision to do it on Apple first, also, and knew about this deal for the disks, also had stock pre-IPO, if I'm not mistaken, stock in Apple, and really worshipped Apple. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the first place to put it, um, you know. And then, of course, Jobs was pushing. Why? Why put it on anything else? You should only put things on business. Yes. You know, on well, yeah, there's a whole. Yeah, you, <laughs> you've done that with with Steve many times. Yeah, one of the things we're noting is how small the industry was in those days. You know, like at Com at Comdex, which is the industry show, 
the principal to show up. So that's why, you know, Bill would ask questions about Vizicalic and, you know, he was birth, it was his, what party did he have during NCC when he was there? So it, it, that's how we got to know these people because again, this was just, you know, it's a tiny industry. The industry was smaller than the pantyhose business. There's a video you can watch about that from the VCS. It's it's one of the computer history museums. Yeah, um, yeah, Dan the, uh, yeah, took a lot of the VCS things. So Seth Steinberg, who did a lot of operating system work uh, at, at what was the Architects Machine Group later became the uh, Media, Media Lab. Lab. And by the way, I learned a little more speech because I heard about uh, what it, working with Perkin Elman and stuff. So we hired him. It was amazing. He was so good that he did a port of the Z80 without ego. That the code matched the 6502 code quite closely so it could maintain the two code bases in sync. They were synced where the comments were in only one of them because it had to say it synced up well and Bob heavily commented the code. Yay, Bob. Not overly commented, but heavily. But heavily commented it. It was and a similar. <laughs> trans, uh, an almost line by line, line translation. The bugs in one were in the other. And to some extent, we could use the macros to help with that too. So that, you know, that was important in those days for you know supporting the machine, and you know so we did the uh, so we did the Z80, and when the IBM PC came out, that was fancy Z80. So we had the same code for the Z80, and each port is a story. Like HP wanted us to port it to the machine called the Apogee, uh, and it was interesting because it had a separate display computer, and to get performance, we loaded our own code into the display computer. And we put a lot of effort into it, which you can ask why, because we knew, and we couldn't tell them, that there was another machine going to be announced the same day they wanted to do their announcement. That was the IBM PC. And the, the IBM PC version was for an 8088, even though we had a Z80. So we had to write a, our, our uh, I, I, the assembler had to be able to do a lot of the work to convert from one to the other. Well, we did the same. I think we kept the same code base for the Z80 and the 8088. Right, but uh, but it did require some work, and that was done by Jeff Stevenson, mm -hmm. um, who actually did the conversion. Um, he um, he was in a double locked room with the with the uh, IBM PC. Uh, uh, prototype, right? It was a breadboard. It was literally. a literal, plywood board, to be exact. Plywood board. And unfortunately, I, if I knew it, I should have said, oh, we lost it when I came to pick it up. Yeah. Oh, and um, yeah, or else we would have had the original one. Uh, Jeff went on to work at Sierra Online and then at Microsoft. Um, and we told people, said, well, my, uh, IBM said, are you protecting it? Well, we said, Jeff's a, a black belt Zen swordsman. You know, don't sign with your IBM name. That you know, all the people see they were signing as IBM Business Software Arts as if. And we visited Boca, um, uh, to uh, when he first did it. It was a whole long story about non disclosure and everything, but I was told later by Craig Newmark that that inspired him our, our visit to uh, Boca and visit him. inspired him to do what to do Craigslist. No, no. I mean, how was he inspired? Well, he oh, started doing this business and everything. Oh, to be to leave. I, he was at IBM. Yeah. Oh, to leave IBM yeah. to, to have a small <laughs> business. He was impressed. No, oh. sometimes wind up with uh, a number of people. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to tell them. We were lucky. You, you shouldn't have been that foolish to follow us, but <laughs> you know. Uh, yes. Uh, but uh, so you know, so the IBM port. Then later, you know, we get into some questionable ports. You know, time effort. The IBM port is the one behind you that you're seeing. Yes. Uh, and that's the one that is that survived because David Reed kept a copy, uncopy protected of it at some point, and I was able to get it from him. He, David would work for, with us. And, it's, and, and, and uh, so we actually had an uncopy protected IBM PC version, early, uh, a uh, preliminary version of it. And then I got permission from IBM through Hooker Crook to be able to post it on the internet so you could run it. So you can actually run the real VisiCal code in IBM PC emulators that run in JavaScript now. Bob and I have done it on all sorts of machines. I, to, I just want to see if I can find a copy. Do you have it? It's out there. Any, any IBM PC emulator that you can get that runs 
you know, in probably written in JavaScript or something, you can, uh, it probably has, comes with a copy of VisiCalc, among other things. But as I said, the sounds are different because it, they probably run too fast. And instead of hearing beep or blip, you're going to hear because it's yeah, so I need to bring up a VM. Unfortunately, Microsoft with the 64-bit version dropped the support for running VisiCalc. Yeah, you can run. Uh, and when I demo VisiCalc, I have to find an old 16. No, you should. I should be able to bring up a bit machine. I have old 32-bit machines that I run in the right emulator. And but well, you should be able to bring up a 32-bit emulator on this. But yeah, I haven't really put in the the, the effort. Uh, and we we did so. We did port to some other machines, and this goes into the fight with this club. We get to if you're interested. Uh, but for when we were doing the advanced version, we decided we need better tools. So Seth designed a language which was Lisp like, or if you or unsugared JavaScript like, if you want to explain to the kids today. Uh, which didn't have garbage collection and reference counts because, again, we tried to stay small. Uh, but it, it turned out, yeah, you know, we wrote an interpreter, and that was a bit too slow. So I, uh, I had the fun of writing a compiler. Um, and it actually performed, it performed pretty well, but it needed a, a big machine, like 256K. Nobody would ever buy a machine that big. Of course, uh, 123 said, screw it, we'll, we'll require that. And it turns out that wasn't a barrier. But, you know, one of the things we did is often over-engineer. Like if we knew, it, maybe it's a fortune, but if we knew people would buy 32K machines, I might not have been as careful of the coding, which would have been less memory for data. It might need a 48K machine. So in those days when people didn't know the value, you know, each of these, uh, you know, design decisions were vital. I mean, it was hundreds of dollars in those days uh, dollars to buy 16k of memory k you know i mean it was you know if you had a 640k computer boy oh boy you know now there was, there was still some 4k apple twos but at least the 16k had become the norm by then um meantime i mean there are various things but first any questions so far I think there, was some, wait, there was some in the chat. Oh, in the chat. I'm looking. How did you know? Okay. We, uh, uh, okay. Let me start in the middle. Let, let's go to the top now. Uh, it's good. I think these are the chat. I need to bring the mouse over. Let me go to the top of the chat. Oh, there's all this stuff here. Uh, it appears the mouse is situated. First machine was 32K, 12 big words. By the way, we don't call it a trash 80. We call it the TRS 80. We give it respect. Yes, but actually, you know, I mean, Radio Shack didn't make it, it didn't have a good visual designer, but the machine itself, you know, it was a reasonable machine. And they were a reasonable company. Okay, in the 99.4, a little backstory there, I first started speaking to Dan Feilstra about uh, working with him to do a basic port. And we, get to, we, pitched, T, we pitched TI on the 99.4 to do it. And Ed Esper was in that group at TI, later joined them, and went on uh, in the industry. Uh, yeah, the Wang Labs history. And we should add a comment that Dan Berkman's word processor predated the Wang word processor. Uh, but the people doing the video did, might not have realized that. Yeah. I mean, I didn't uh, write it my, alone. There were, there were three or four of us. On yes. The it was written in uh, assembly language for the PDP-8. And fit in, it, did, it fit inside the VT-100? Oh, now how do I know, how do we know that there was demand for a PC-based spreadsheet? Uh, because I was an MBA student. I knew what was, you know. simple way, there was demand, Dan wanted it. I wanted it, I needed it. <laughs> and we found out real quick when we demoed it to people that business people that could people who were non-computer people said of course computers can do stuff like that what's so special people who had no need for it said who cares i can do two plus two yes if you go to, to, a, to an accountant or a bookkeeper or something they would start shaking and pushing credit cards in your face they were so excited by it 
because it changed their lives. It made, yeah. as some people told us, it made accounting fun. It changed but, the whole accounting world. Yeah, but part of the issue in those days was the dealers. Made it too fun. What? Yeah, the dealers. French made accounting too fun. Yes. Too the, fun, yeah. <laughs> the SEC charged a lot of us financial IT folks to go and take spreadsheets away from the accountants and make them use programs that actually had accountability for the data they put in. <laughs> yeah, now the thing about, the, the thing, if you think about it, at least with a spreadsheet, you can look under the hood. Of course, the printout, you can't be sure because you don't know what it did. But you can always look under the hood to see how it's done. But nobody did. Take, take the out, they do. You know, but take, take, because if you had to, you would, right? No, I understand. But a lot of people look under the hood of chat GPT. That's live. You can do it. But retrospective forensic accounting is difficult when uh, the data that was computed in the spreadsheet is uploaded, but the. Uh, right, but the, the right, but the underlying, which is why you need the underlying spreadsheet. I have a niece who is a, uh, uh, a, co- a cousin's daughter who, she's a forensic accountant, which uh, whatever. Yeah. But the thing is, at least you could do that if you had some program from somebody else. You had a trust that was good enough, and you know that almost all programs have bugs. Yeah, and a lot of people don't understand the bugs. For example, when you did an insert, where did it go? There are all these edge cases. Again, we didn't have memory, enough memory. No, to but I'm thinking that. about other programs, Bob, because he's talking about you have to use, you know, a certified program. Oh, yeah. No, now, I understand that. But I'm saying there are lots of traps. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, Let it, me tell you about a particular certified program. There was a device that came out called the HP 35. It was the first scientific calculator, you know, the one. The, the type you could fit in your pocket. Very important machine. And um, HP was very, they wrote about it in their publication and they were very, uh, very proud of the, the the algorithm they used for doing logarithms and stuff like that and, and boasted about the whole thing. Well, it turned out if you took the log of 2.02, it came out, you know, and then went back, you ended up with two. It had singularities at 1.01, I think, at 2.02 and 3.03. Exactly those values, not 2.01199999999. And it had a, you know, and then what about the the Pentium bug, right? Yes. So there are all these things that theoretically are okay, but there are. Um, well, but this gets back to the problem thing. We we're so careful about making sure the rounding errors matched what people did by calculators in hand, and then discovered later nobody cares. Yeah, what, but the thing I, what they would do with the spreadsheet is they would do the same thing they did with paper is they would frequently have, you know, do cross tabs and things like that. So at least there may be some. They were trying, yeah. But the problem is that it, it, no matter what base we use, it still gets some rounding errors and stuff. Yeah, so never, we just want the errors to be, seem right to humans. And yeah, but, but humans. logic, I think Bill's talking about logic errors and stuff like that. Thing, but, yeah. that was, but one thing it reminds me is one of the features is, is, uh, Error bounds, in other words, significant digits. So if you multiply two numbers, significance goes down. And IBM had a feature on the 7030, which had noisy mode with they fill it with ones instead of zeros. If the two are different, you knew you had a significance problem. So I thought about putting this VisiCalc, tracking the significance digit, but I rapidly realized that was a bad idea because after a few columns, there's no significance left. And worse, most of the numbers were guesstimates anyway. Oh, yeah. Also, also I remember now the, the Visicalc didn't use precedence. If you did well, one that was a design decision. Yeah, well, there, there were a couple things for it. But one of the things was that we were going after calculators. People were using hand calculators with paper and pencil, right? And there were two fields of thought in there. There was, you know, uh, the, uh, the infix type. One plus three equals, and then there was the HP version, which I have one up there, which is one enter two plus, okay, which was the reverse Polish. And people, you know, which was it and whatever. So we just went with the same as a calculator, the type of it's run this type of the GP calculator. Like one plus four times three, it would do it as you typed it in, not right, as you typed it in. Which screwed people up because we realized. 
one of the things we discovered with with PCs and everything is people, in a sense, more computer literate than we expected. They all can type. It turns out so, type would be a barrier. It wasn't a barrier. Okay, and they learned to type because of it. For college, yeah. No, no, no. What? There was there's no word processing when we came out. Nobody had a word That's processor. No, but they learned to type a typewriter, as I was saying, beforehand. No, how many people had somebody type their, their thesis for them? Some did, but more and more college students had time. Typing, ha paying somebody who was executive secretary grade to type the final draft is a different thing from typing your own drafts. Uh, every no, no business person in those days typed their own stuff. Well, but no, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, business school business people were offended by the idea that they might do manual labor. Yes. Well, no, but they didn't type. I mean, and remember to. If you wanted to fix, you mark it yes, up and you get yes, it back, it and they retype thing. the whole thing because you Absolutely. had to type it real fast. In, in business, as opposed to technical fields, it was a class thing, and right. men who wore suits did not touch keyboards no, until cool. you gave them a reason to. So we gave them a reason. Yeah, to. And and this was went back to discussion. I remember having with JCR Licklatter in about 1971. How do you get executives to use computers? And one of the things is get rid of the keyboard. Turns out the answer is much simpler. Make it useful to them. Give them a good reason why, if they don't, they'll be fine. <laughs> whoever uh, whoever used VisiCalc got promoted, and whoever but, didn't, didn't. <laughs> but only middle managers did. If one okay, I take exception to Bill. I typed my own papers when I was in graduate school. Oh, so did I. But I learned to type in eighth grade. Yes. I learned to right? have over I have my grandfather's I mean, I'm very Jerry were you were you a business major or a technical person I was a business major I have an MBA from my Emory oh good God but, uh, yeah I learned to type in elementary school you had me uh, fooled Jerry you yeah. had the business school fooled too I guess <laughs> yes. uh, my mother brought home typewriters discarded typewriters for the Board of Higher Education in New York so I learned to type on 1930s underwood on the typewriters right. which is very good practice for the teletype Oh yeah! Oh god! Okay. You're so good on the teletype, Bob. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, I, I, I hear you there because uh, I, I had my dad's college portable, uh, and yes, the. Uh, well, the portables are even much easier than, than those old this, underwear. This is my grandfather's that I learned to type on. Right. I still have my editor I of. Still have the typewriter I used in college. You see that? I, see when I look at those, the, I still look at those. The ones I use, well, that, that's so much fancier. I'm talking about the upright for the big. Uh, oh, I got one of those up there. Yes, I, they're too heavy to pick up. But this is you the know, one it's a two color type ribbon, we, which Multic supported. Yeah. Uh, but so the typing, learn to type is a very useful skill. Uh, and it turns out it's more common than I suppose. Um, but, you know, it's still try to tell people in the 60s that everybody would be typing this papers online and email. Nobody believed it. it was, you're not going to use a computer for such a trivial thing like that. Yeah. But I think part of the thing there, and this goes back, is both Dan and I had unlimited access to computing because we were on the inside. Right. And so, in high school. Yeah. So computers are very expensive, but we were used to, especially, I was online since 66, so that was, for, you know, I expected interactive computing, and, you know, we worked on screens and stuff, so that, that I mean, there was multiple worlds, there was a business world of serious computing, and there was, you know, we worked with that world, but we were just used to the attitude that we could be creative, it was a creative medium, and I think that's part of, you know, what shaped us. So um, let's see, test suite, uh, making new sport. We had a whole QA department. I don't know what they used. Well, uh, one thing I've got to say, just a Wang thing. Now, as far as I know, Wang did not do a spreadsheet computer. HP, on the other hand, wanted to do their own version for the HP 83, was it 85? Uh, and then HP they 85, and we gave them source. Yeah, and, and they did it was a decent job. That was Tycho Hal. Was the guy who we interfaced with a class, uh, person I went to business school with, and later they did, did the work site, the spreadsheet only machine that nobody wanted. It turns out you wanted spreadsheet functionality, you didn't want a spreadsheet machine. Uh, but HP tried. So HP had some interesting stuff, and they did their own stuff. They had a touch input, which is HP one hundred and fifty, 
they kept trying, but it sort of never became mainstream until recently when they, you know, changed the company and redid them. Um, the deck stuff, well, it, it was, uh, we knew it would never sell. Oh, let's not talk about deck. And the deck people involved in the same machines agreed with us. <laughs> Originally, VisiCalc was supposed to be for a deck machine, not for the Apple II. Oh, well, that was earlier days. Originally, yes, we're going to do a VT100. First. That's before, yeah. I was going to, uh, no, not a VT100. It was a VT, no. It, it, VDT, it was a VD, uh, it was a, a VDT, I think, or something. A VDT, a, which is a VT. It was a, a, a sorry, PDT. A, a PDT, PDT computer, which is an LSI 11 based machine. Inside. It's kind of a, a, a follow on to a machine I had worked on, the VT71, uh, which had a display, pro incredible display processor and LSI 11 inside of it and all, which was a, for editing and typesetting from 1975, I think it was. I, mean, yeah, I worked on the hardware. A friend of mine was a product manager there, so we, but eventually, you know, realized carrying it on our backs to boardrooms one by one is not going to be the business. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, we thought of that. I'm going to have to go in a minute. Any, any other oh, questions? Oh, actually, one other thing I should mention. Is when we talked about it, we talked about heads up displays, pointing, and everything, all these fancy graphics things. Um, and it, it, the amazing thing is how little value it would have added to the basic spreadsheet functionality. I mean, we'll see. Yes. Yeah. We'll see. No, well, we're going to see. No, but remember, the computer now we have is billions and billions of times the computing capacity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and uh, Bob, there's a question. Do, uh, do we still have interest in computing software code business? I still code for a living. The last time I wrote code was right a few seconds before I pushed. Well, actually, I re did some stuff while I was. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, of course, I, I couldn't survive if I'm not. I wouldn't say coding. Those and, things, I've been spent the last few days fighting with chat GPT to write code. Uh, I, 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 I had a uh, very successful app on the, uh, on the iPad when it, right after it came out. Um, and yeah. it, it was an Apple, an iOS developer, still do iOS, do a little bit of iOS development mainly. I do JavaScript, Bob, you do a lot of JavaScript now too. I TypeScript is my preferred TypeScript. language. So, yeah, you know, so yes, I'm very in, it, it heavily into the tools and stuff. So, yeah, uh, it, it, it's for me, it's also the way I deal with ADHD. It's a good calming. Oh, thing. GW graphics. The G was for graphics, right? GW basic. Probably was that. Is that the was called on the which was GW? I don't know. GW basic. Um, it was. I thought it was G Wiz basic. G Wiz maybe. Did it do? Oh, well, whose was it? We can look it up. Uh, okay. yeah. the, the last thing that Bill Gates shipped software for, I think, was a game for the IBM PC. I thought it was a Radio Shack 100. It might have been well, that was a, the last real code for OS code, was OS. the RS100. But then later, when the IBM PC came out, I think he had done one of the games. We'll play part of it. I got it. Something, yeah, or something. At least that's, I remember him talking about that once. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the whole B PC working from the listings, which actual properties, which bugs are they going to fix? One of the things we had to do is there were bugs in the BIOS. And we had to program in case they fixed the bug. Yeah, they couldn't change, they couldn't change the BIOS. Everybody depended on it. No, but they did. No, they actually fixed some of the bugs. And that was a problem. No, I, but fortunately, I programmed a code that would work with the bugs and without the bug. Yeah, the technical reference manual up there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have a few copies of it out in the garage. Yeah, Dan since has done a couple of spreadsheets in JavaScript. Yeah, I did one for the one laptop per child. Mm -hmm. And that evolved in various ways. And, and yeah, it was uh, social calc. Oh, what is the foolish it's open source? You can read it. Yeah, one of the foolish things Dan did was ooh. The super so an OLPC. I have an OLPC right there, about three feet from my hands. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the one of the competing programs was SuperCalc, and they didn't support the arrow key. And Dan said, "Oh, what about the arrow key?" And I 
before I can slap him and say, don't give them any ideas. Yeah, no, that was, it's really, now, Bob, I'll let you tell your story because it's hard to come up with a name for things. What did, what, who is the company that made uh, SuperCow? It's a company called Sourcem. Mm -hmm. And what did Sourcem? Micro is spelled backwards. Yes. By the way, the spreadsheet. So you're going to tell your visit count, but if yeah. you want. So we, uh, I had Dan Foster and I were having breakfast at 4 a.m. at. He's the publisher. Eggs on one on Mass Ave. I, I assume they're not there anymore. Who knows? No, they're not. Um, and basically coming up with names. And uh, my father's company was Telematic. And he wrote the logo with a, with a, a big T sort of an antenna that went into the M. So it's sort of a stylized capital M. So I had the idea, which familiar with intracaps. So that's like a visible calculator. I figured, okay, it's a good name, and but it capitalized the V and the C and put into one word. So the logo and the name were the same. And that was not very common in those days. Uh, and actually, and I was trying to remember the timing. Uh, Mr. Feilstra thinks he came up with the name. You think uh, he came up with the name. No, but I, I can tell, tell you why. The he made the decision to use the name yeah. out of the money that you had. No, he, he, right. We, he and you both, you both agreed where, where the name came up from. Yeah. So, what, that you were having to fix you on one. The things that puzzled me. Like I, physical, physical. Yeah. I thought Pascal had intercaps first. But Wirth said we did have it first. So I don't know. I didn't really research the history. Wait, who said, Wirth said what? Uh, that Visicoc had intercaps first, but I thought oh. Pascal already had them. Because before then, you wrote a variable name with an underscore to separate the words. Mm -hmm. And then the intercaps meant you could run as one word with capitals in the middle. You use camel case. Well, camel case is where the first one is, is lowercase. So some languages can't. They're, they're all these terms, but intercaps. Unless they're using the first letter to count uppercase to mean something, but whatever. Yes. Uh, so that's you know the origin of the name. Um, so the why you know, would all PC use QWERTY keyboards? Why not? That's what everybody has. Yes. I use I mainly use Excel uh, for work that I do. Uh, well, a Commodore. I end up using. Uh, oh, why would they use no? What OLPC had to, had to be used by computer people and everybody else. You don't do something. The, the answer is what else would you use? Um, but uh, I, I'll i use Google Google Docs uh, when others are using it, when I'm sharing and stuff like that. So obviously, whenever somebody has a Google Doc, I use that. Yeah. Um, um, it, it, just keyboards. Turns out any all the other keyboards, or at least alphabetic keyboards, do worse. The Devorah keyboard is supposedly better. Turns out it's not better. So, you know, it's pretty arbitrary. And once you learn it, the real problem I have is fools who, who use letters in a keyboard arrangement where they think there's a map on the keyboard. Well, those of us who touch type don't know where our fingers are. So if you tell me L key is right, J key is left, that's arbitrary. If you tell me F is forward and Control B is backwards, that makes sense to me. So that's you know part of the, sort of the keyboard. Okay. I mean, if you're if if you uh, if you edit a lot of video, you're used to <laughs> some look, you know, where things are on the keyboard and stuff like well, that. Well, eventually, yeah, the oh, you know, and that's about to change now. Wait till you. Uh, I know you're you're really into the Apple VR. <laughs> uh, the Apple, it's not VR. It's their spatial computing. Yes. Hand input. You can write your own gesture recognizers. One of the examples they have is recognized using doing this. And you know, if you can make a heart with your hand, that it means something. What if you have the middle finger up? Does it recognize it? Uh, it sure can. Yes. That's well, really well, easy for it to figure that out. Well, the, 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 that's a discussion of coming up with sort of popular idioms. So everybody has their own gestures as a teacher. That's more complicated than if there's some common ones. So we'll see how that, again, we're going to discover how all these things work out. Uh, I don't know if, if hand input is overrated. Well, first of all, hand input is used on phones, and that's been extremely successful. Uh, but the, um, the hand in the air type one, Apple's is not like anybody else's. Okay. You, it's, first of all, you don't have your hand out here mm -hmm. because they, in fact, they tell you specifically, don't use much of that because people will get tired. 
you know, it's all done basically the same way that you would do with your mouse and stuff like that. Um, and um, let's take a let's wait to see. But every all the developers that I've listened to that have tried the new Apple stuff were really impressed with how good the hand input, uh, hand and eye input is. It's pretty cool. Well, okay, getting back to the spreadsheet stuff. Uh, Microsoft, of course, did multiplayer. And they didn't get the joke in the sense that they thought it was a table that rose in columns with quarters. Yeah. Oh, but Kurt, uh, Quest 2 is not the Apple device. Listen to what everybody who's tried it has said, who owns Quest 2s and have tried all those things or whatever, have tried everybody else, um, you know. Um, no, I mean, but, I, tried, I tried Oculus. It was not you know. well. You know people who have used the fifteen thousand dollar headsets, right? Yeah. Uh, you know very well. And when the real expensive ones are somewhat better, this is even better than that. Oh, what I, know, I, 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 know, I look, I appreciate how much you know. I put it, but it may, it may also reminds me. The other thing is, if you look at like Excel. Oh, and by the way, blind people can use the the new IB uh, the new Apple thing. They have a whole set about how you can use it when you're blind. Um, so it's, um, that's where the touch input is used and stuff like that. Just like if you've ever seen a blind person use an iPhone, they're incredible, uh, how fast they can use it and stuff like that. The same thing applies to, to vision OS and they're very, um, uh, concerned about making sure that it will work for people who can, uh, it's, they really work for the disabled. Yeah. I mean, for example, um, if you're, uh, if you, they'll do things where if you, I think you can't even use your hands. If you look at something and then continue to look at it the right amount of time or something, they'll they'll then open up a uh, a voice input. Uh, and I mean they have all sorts of options. Take a look at the the uh, the videos that Apple has uh, from the developers conference about uh, input uh, about um, you know about. Uh, uh, the uh, support for disabled and stuff like that. So let's see. Um, yeah, the, the one other thing I was comment is one of the things we didn't appreciate the value of spreadsheets for presentation. And that's where Quattro excelled, <laughs> to use the term. Uh, so, and that's, a, you know, it, it, sort of. A, a, a big use case as sort of not to do the calculations, but to present them. And well, even one, two, three, one, two, three had better looking output than we did. Yes. And, and then Excel had better looking output than one, two, three. So, but Quattro sort of set a standard for how many graphs and stuff it added and things like that. Yeah, but uh, Excel, you know. No, Excel now. No, I'm saying this. So one, two, three did, did because one, two, three had different with columns and it had uh, commas and numbers and it had real graphs. Did we, did we did I leave out commas and numbers? Sure did. That Oops. was a big thing. Mitch said, apparently that's the first question people asked. They, uh, not Mitch, this was um, uh, uh, Vern. People Vern. said, does it have commas and numbers and a variable column width? It does. I want one, two, three. Yeah. That was now, it. And it, it, the, the, so the, the one of the things is VisiCorp basically decided, we won't go into all the things with VCs, that they wanted to keep us busy on side projects that were going nowhere, like pointing to the deck machines. So we didn't get a chance to do this kind of development that we would have had if we worked together as a single company. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, they, were, they were basically succumbed to the VC madness and wanting to get rid of us where they just saw where it cost, not appreciating, you know, the engineering. So they even came out with a point to showing why they couldn't afford to pay us anything. And it really soured the relationship when we found it was a fake spreadsheet with mathematical errors. This is the, the business relationship between the author and the publisher. And people don't do that anymore because we were the... Um, the poster child for not doing that. Right. Well, the thing is, if they saw us as their engineering department that we worked with, it would work better. But we we needed direct contact with the customers to learn and to get features. We need to focus on what they wanted, not um, going to do useless ports on usable machines. And, and look, one, two, three also did some clunk reports before the IBM PC became a standard, like with Compaq. 
Uh, the other machines would behave slowly because they you couldn't get the same high interactive. Yeah, they for the other machines they had a right to they had to do like uh, ASCII writing like they were writing to a, a VT100. Well, and that was also why, right, as opposed to the IBM PC that they wrote right to the, the display buffer. It's interesting. See, this is why it was a good thing we did do concurrent CPM because it had that interface. And later, uh, you know, we it, it, sort of the. Uh, one of the presidents of uh, digital research who did the process, yeah, we were right. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was a bad design to emulate an old terminal because it really didn't get the new high performance screen interfaces. So people are starting to drop off, um, but and I got to go. It's 8 30. Oh, okay, I think this is but, a no. Uh, but Bob, if you want to keep. Uh, well, let's you know. see if anybody has any other questions. And, and then I'll get back to trying to figure out how to use DHCP option 12. So, Bob, good to talk with you. Okay. <laughs> Take care. I'll see you. Man. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. I hope you found interesting and ask Bob for more stuff. He's, he knows so much about a lot of the stuff. So take care. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks. And Bye. Bob. Thank you. Um, I'm going to switch the background off because uh, I think the background doesn't go off. Oh, I took the wrong thing. Reason is um okay but as you can tell you know you guys have been still programming hacking you can see the screen behind there is showing my mqtt stream for example for that house but that's a whole separate conversation mm -hmm. um so are there other questions Something to make you noise. Some helicopter landing. <laughs> okay, well, there are no questions. I saw Jerry look up at the sound of a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, I I heard that I was actually typing some mail to Ron, telling him that he missed a meeting. Oh, uh, well, it's still recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Do send me the URL when this this is done. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, it's going to be on our website. No, I can even provide pictures. Like you know, working in the attic. Luckily, the apartment I had in Arlington, mm -hmm. along Paul Revere's route, um, it had, we it, it, we had an attic room, which was turned out to be the whole another floor. So it gave me enough space to work. So that was very useful. There's a question in the chat about whether you've uh, ever tried to port any BizCalc to the iOS. Uh, I, why? I mean, iOS came. The real question is why didn't we port it to the Mac? Okay. And a couple of reasons. You know, when Jaws first showed me the Mac, I was used to graphic screens. I mean, a lot of people realize, you know, we knew about this technology. Media Lab had done all this heads up displays, all this stuff. The challenge was to make it work. And it turns out, we didn't have the resource at that point to do much with the Mac. And the Mac in those days had less memory than the Apple II, which was up, you know, that added more memory to it. Um, so we couldn't be distracted. It didn't have things like a file system. So it's fairly primitive. Uh, one, so, you know, one, two, three, which basically happened because I told you a story about, you know, Visicorp, which was the original person software, basically not being not behaving well and and not seeing the, not having enough enlightened self interest to want to basically merge with us so we have a, a common thing so they pissed off their product physical product manager Mitch Mitch uh, Kapoor, who then went on to do one two three uh, so that's you know some of the backstory there so you can imagine you know how differently things could have gone I mean it's not a regret I think you know done well since then. Uh, but just to give you some idea of you know how the history worked out. So it was I mean one of the th interesting things is how few spreadsheets were in those days. I mean, the fact that it took so long for people to clone us and the clones before one, two, three were actually not very good by comparison. And the first good clone was done by the physical product manager. So it's a very it's a reminder the history is not convergent that these ideas as obvious as they are now weren't obvious in those days. Oh, Bob, uh, it looks like I misunderstood the question from the chat. He was actually asking about uh, 
whether you'd uh, done any anything with like simple apps on iOS or Android to access uh, Chat GPT. Uh, no, I've been playing with mostly TypeScript on the PC. I do my Dan's done a lot of iOS work, and you got to realize he's worked with the Vision stuff. Uh, I've been mainly using web apps because I'm interested more in issues of really rethinking computing connectivity. So the stuff in the background, how do you, uh, and this is, I gave a talk on sort of my home control stuff and realizing it's more, it's not really about home control as much as why would you run a wire to do control when you can have messaging independent of the power? Just like we have the internet as network independent, relationship independent of the path. So that's the stuff I've been working on and trying to make a public policy for, for what I'm calling ambient connectivity. So that's been more my focus. But um, And it was actually Dan who, who uh, got, got me to understand that JavaScript is high performance and it's only gotten better since then. So it turns out, you know, it's a very powerful programming language. So I do use ChatGPT to generate TypeScript code. Uh, which is a whole interesting experience because picture uh, it, my son does like to immediate savant, but it's like a junior programmer who can do some stuff brilliantly, but it's thick as a brick, which is a term, by the way, uh, chat GPT does not like and told me I shouldn't be, we should respect my elders or something. Uh, so it'll do great things and then do stupid things and with the same degree of ease. But uh, no, pro uh, the programming tools are becoming more fun these days. And we're going to see the future because I wrote an article in the you know, history of programming and said in the future, we're just going to throw the code against the wall and see what happens. And that's sort of what we're doing with, with ChatGPT now. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it'll generate code, but you've got to take responsibility for looking at it to see what it's doing that's brilliant you can learn from and what it's doing that's dumb you got to fix. But again, that's a whole discussion in its own right. And I think it's a lot of the spreadsheet works are going to go in that direction, that rather than going for precise calculations, you're going to have uh, these AI engines do the analysis. And that's a discussion in its own right, going back to the von Neumann machine, separating bits from the meaning and stuff. But again, a whole topic in its own right. So I keep looking at your cat down there. Uh, so, see if there's any other question. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the thing about simple apps for the um, Android and things, the short thing is, you know, uh, it's not. You know, it's, if it's interesting, I do it. But at the moment, there's so many people doing apps and stuff. What I really want to do is get rid of apps for Android and iOS and just have uh, basically take the web approach of web apps and should be able to run it anywhere without installing it. Because I've got like 500 things installed on my Android and that's just absurd. Yeah, but if it's a web app, it can't steal the user information and sell it. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I'm sh I, I wouldn't put it past people to figure out how to do that. Oh, yeah, I, Google and Facebook sure know how to do it from a web browser. Yes. But the... Uh, you know. The problem with web apps is uh, you, can't, you can't access them when you're uh, not connected to the internet. No, you can. That's the whole point of, of PWAs. They can work. You, you're running a lot of web apps now. You might not realize it. Like Washington Post app, I think, is a web app. No, that's the way to write it. So web apps are first-class programming environments that allow you to run standalone programs. That's the value. So if you're into the geek thing, that service workers will say, oh, the stuff's not there. I'll just bring a cash version in. So that's why I haven't spent time on iOS or Android specific. So anything else or? Well, that, when, what? Oh, sorry. When... Um, People started cloning and making their own spreadsheet programs. Did you guys think about having like a legal response to that, or was it? Well, it, it's interesting. By the time it became a serious legal thing, we don't. Thanks to Visicorp's bad behavior, we you know basically 
got bought out by one, two, three. But Mitch, Mitch was our deadly competitor, but he was also a nice guy. So he sort of bought out our assets. And then they wound up suing, uh, you know, Quattro for cloning and some of those efforts. But uh, I was no longer really involved in spreadsheets. I was more into email and then later on trying to do home network and things like that. I mean, for me, for Dan, VisiCalc was a direct useful thing to him because he was in business school. For me, it was the exception of a program I didn't use much myself, but it was still useful. I, I basically like to build tools and share them. So before that, like when I was in interactive data, I wrote a debugger for myself that became the corporate standard debugger, things like that. I wrote an email program because I needed it, and then other people can use it. But uh, no. nobody else has questions. Jerry, it's your meeting. You decide. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess we're pretty much done now. No problem. Yeah. I have a question in the chat. Um, where do you see the PC world headed? What? Where do you see the PC world headed now? It's hard to say. I mean, I like the idea of these open platforms. And I think Microsoft is basically trying to cater developers a lot, building tools and everything. So uh, I, I, I don't like it that the, as they're building as much smarts in. Um, so I, I'm more looking at, okay, a platform. I, I, right now, one, one of the byproducts of writing for um, in TypeScript is I'm more more platform agnostic. There's still the vast bulk of the tools are Windows only, so stay there. Uh, but even Windows, you, it runs Unix very well. WSL, I can run Unix apps. Beyond that, the worry I have, well, it's always been a case. People call digital literacy uh, the ability to type. I guess if you view things as digits, it makes sense. Or, you know, if you use Facebook. But the real thing is, I, uh, I want to transcend the computers for the basic concepts. Um, so it's hard to say. I mean, again, you saw Dan's excitement about the Apple visual interface. I think it's going to be interesting. I don't think it's going to replace this. Uh, but the real question is, where can we build the tools? So it's hard to say. Um, my, right now, I want to focus on basically more about devices. In other words, this programming the PCs, the web. But I'm looking at more what you can do with physical devices. So all the Shelly devices I have. Well, you saw the last meeting. I was playing with those. So that's really what interests me. How do we basically merge computing into the physical world and move the distinction? But, I mean, large language models work by that. Everything is squished into bits. So we're going to see what happens when we transcend the physical. Will our desktop machines be museum curiosities? What is a desktop machine? Uh, because I, I think the problem with, with these silly things is they're a pinhole. There's only so much I want to do through this little pinhole. So I want various form factors. And this is where the term progressive web apps comes in. That it's not mobile first, portable windows. It's sort of large area, small area. And how do you use each one and the richness? So I think that's more the issue of, you know, it's, whether it's on a desktop or laptop. I mean, I find I don't get as much done on the road because I'm used to, uh, let me see if I can get this up. Oh, yeah. Having a couple of screens. Okay. So that I can put things where I want to can use, you know, all of the capabilities. So it's not the desktop machine per se. Uh, I think we need to remove the distinction between like television for viewing surfaces, various purposes. So we're still in the early days. My question is, why do we still have a thing called a television? That's a strange concept. So, um, and as computing becomes cheaper, hopefully all these little boxes like Roku's and stuff will become first class computing engines and we'll be able to, you know, just use web apps uh, for all purposes. And I really think. Yeah, you know, for a while, the browser engine is going to be a nice computing platform because it is very portable. The thing that worries me is like 
having all these little boxes everywhere uh, and then having to implement like the complicated web standards for all of them. Like there's just so much room for error in doing that. Uh, well, uh, 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 so my, uh, my real worry is like someone's gonna, you know, like I buy a new smart plug from TP link and they only update it for two years. And then I'm like, no. Uh, okay. That's a, so the whole smart plug stuff is really dumb. Okay. Because, um, this is why I want to use generic web interfaces, HTTP things on the devices. So with my Tasmoda bulb, I just go to the web interface. I don't need any other tools. Uh, and then, you know, and that, it's it, where most of the smart plugs are into silos and separate apps. I'm more interested in sort of open interfaces so I can maintain control, even if it's not updated. But I'm really like, so the example I gave, of TP Link, they make smart plugs that use like open standards for what, what, what open stand? Um, Matter is the new one. Oh, the, the, yeah, the Matter, that piece of crap. So, yeah, I agree with you. What I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, I'm not so much concerned about not being able to interact with the devices in the future, more that like I'm just concerned that the manufacturers will not be able to keep them secure in the future, especially if they have to implement a web stack as like and try yeah. to make, keep that future proof. Like, that's just really hard to well, do. Well, no, that, well, okay. The device themselves do not need to implement the web stack. In the they don't have browsers. Remember, your server is orders and orders of magnitude simpler yeah, sure. than the thing. So it's those devices thing. really should just have HTML, HTTP servers, which are much simpler. So, like my job is exploiting HTTP servers, and there's a lot of error in in HTTP servers. Like what? Um, like just parsing HTTP. Uh, is often done incorrectly, just like determining well, where the headers end. No, well, this is why I use Express now. For example, on Android, uh, on Node. I if you know bugs in Express, it's a package which takes care of the HTTP part. And HTTP itself, I mean, I've written raw to sockets, is not that complicated enough to get into quick and trying to be fancy, but for the most part, an HTTP one is sufficient. And, and, I wrote my own package for handling SQL, so I'm safe from injection and things like that. I guess, like, my, yeah, you, you can. The matter, I don't trust for that reason. <laughs> I, I, all I'm saying is, like, HTTP one is a simple standard, and you can read it and believe that you understand it. And yeah. then, like, there's just a lot of room for error in implementation. So, for example, there was one server I just uh, we are now able to talk about it. We found a denial of service where. You say that the content length is the negative length of the message, and it wasn't checking the sign of the content length. So it skipped backward and reread the same message again, and it would infinite loop doing that. Oh, and like all sorts of weird room for problems you'd never expect. Um, yes. No, I, and I'm very interested. I, I'd be very interested in continuing. Send me a note, because I want to maybe you can write a column for the uh, IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine, which is, we won't talk about IEEE not understanding any of this stuff. But I'm very interested in Kang device, the vulnerabilities, because part of my ambient connectivity is firewalls basically give the illusion of security. Okay. Uh, but a lot of our devices don't have that. So I wrote things like, how do you manage uh, virtual communities of devices? Uh, how do you handle, like, one of the things I, uh, I wrote, I'll put it in here. is why do, we need to get rid of the, the idea of putting semantics in the DNS. That's one of these terrible, terrible ideas because it doesn't guarantee security. Matter of fact, it creates vulnerability by simply, you know, the name match doesn't mean anything. So we need to basically have, look, teach people about GUIDs, binding identifiers and things. So we can start to maintain, don't try to fold all things into one mechanism. You know, so that's the start of it. We need to get rid of, so now you depend upon topological security. Uh, we need, you know, there are many ways. We need multiple levels. Like, it's not secure, insecure, it's trust relationships. So I should be able to work with the site before I log in until I need to establish credentials. And then there might be multiple levels. And Jared Sproul has spoken about some of that also. So, yeah, there's a, a lot we're learning. And I want to... To, at the same time, 
open everything up, make them all available at the same time, realize it's going to take us a while to learn how to operate in this new environment. Yeah, our instincts betray us. But then they always have. I mean, the reason why the term con and conning somebody comes from confidence, you basically learn how to hijack the mechanism of trust. So no matter how much security you're doing, you've got one real vector that can get through any of security barriers. It's a very squishy vector. Humans. You, you, you know, you, you can do whatever you want, but if you tell, do you know about the teddy bear attack? Okay, people were warned there's a virus going around your computer, and if you look at the, in the Windows directory someplace, there's a teddy bear icon. Delete that file. That was a Java engine. <laughs> so people can easily be conned in, into, you know, doing arbitrary harm. Uh, so no matter how much you put up security barrier, and Multics, they put up a very big security barrier, and in order to get work done, you had to get around it. So there's, and uh, uh, what makes it most difficult is that the people you properly trust might be wrong, or what you did in the past might now be sabotaged. So it's, it's a messy thing, and the real question is how do we survive all these attacks? We're not going to prevent them. How do we survive them? And how much time should we waste on, you know, uh, uh, on, on the trivial or unlikely attacks? Like, do you like, you know, do you like your your doors, but, but you still have windows which are easily broken? <laughs> so we have to get the right balance. But I think there is a new thing you're getting through is the fact that we can have remote attacks at scale. And I really worry that the primary use of chat GPT is going to be find these things and exploit them. So don't worry. The next species will appreciate the planet we left them, especially the Venusians. Is that too dark? So, any other questions? Yeah, sounds like we're done. Okay. Hopefully. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. Thank well, you, Bob. Thanks, Sean. Okay. So, send me the link when the video is there. That'll I did. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Look. Okay. Look. How do how do I undo this? There's got to be a get out of here. Oh, here, the hang up button. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 